Мы все одна команда. Всех граждан России, которые... Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Vladimir Putin maintains his grip on power, securing a fifth term as Russia's president in an election that observers say was no contest at all. Welcome to your world tonight. I'm Stephanie Skanderis, also on the program. Thanks for being a lovely husband and an amazing father all the time. A public funeral in Ottawa for the six people, including four kids, killed in a home last week. We'll take you there. And later, how protests over the war in Gaza are creating rifts in Berlin's arts and culture scene. Vladimir Putin is declaring victory. Early exit polls from Russia's presidential election show he claimed 87.8% of the vote. The results were never in doubt. Putin has all but eliminated any real opposition inside the country. But within Russia and around the world, thousands of people staged resistance with protests at polling stations and embassies. Briar Stewart reports. As millions of ballots cast across Russia were counted, there were no surprises. It appears Vladimir Putin has won by a landslide Putin, Putin. in an election that the White House said wasn't free or fair. Before he died last month in an Arctic penal colony, imprisoned opposition leader Alexei Navalny called for Russians to go to polling stations at noon and vote for other candidates or spoil their ballot. And lines formed in St. Petersburg and in Moscow today in a small sign of dissent. We gathered here to make our protest in a legal way, said one 19-year-old who didn't want to disclose his name. Navalny's widow, Yulia Navalnaya, joined the crowd in Berlin today. She waited hours to vote, and when she did, she wrote the name Navalny on her ballot. Officials say around 2 million Russians living abroad were eligible to take part in the election. Many of them gathered in London and other cities across Europe. Speaking out against Putin in a way their fellow citizens can't back in Russia. In London, some waited a few hours to vote in an election they don't believe in. I think I'll vote against everybody. Yana Nevdamskaya is part of a volunteer group that was doing an exit poll. But she says the embassy staff made it clear they didn't want them there. She left Russia in the early days after it launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I just want to be here right now to help with at least anything I can do. But I don't think that it will change anything. And Further down the line, Misha Shapolov waits with his two-year-old son. I don't see any bright future for Russia. In, I'm not sure how many years it should be to make Russia a democracy state. Security had been stepped up at many voting sites. Authorities say someone threw a petrol bomb at the embassy in Moldova where voting was underway Sunday. There were also reports of someone setting off a firecracker at a polling station in Russia. According to OVD Info, a Russian human rights group, more than 70 people were detained today during the vote. But nothing was going to impede Putin from winning his fifth term. And now that he has another victory, some are anxious that he will do whatever he can to win in Ukraine. Uh, try to provide new uh, offense on Ukraine. During this Kirill Martinov is the editor of the European edition of the independent Russian news site Novaya Gazeta. I think that for sure they need new military mobilization. This is one, if you check, you know, for example, Google Trends, what Russians uh, is searching on Google these days, this is the main fear of Russian population. In his victory speech tonight, Putin spoke about how the country needs to make the military stronger and that his win will allow Russia to become more consolidated. Prior Stewart, CBC News, London. And Vladimir Putin talked about Alexei Navalny in his victory speech. Putin said he supported the idea of releasing Navalny from prison in an exchange just days before he died. Putin said he agreed to the idea on the condition Navalny didn't return to Russia. Well, it was an act of violence that shocked Ottawa and the country. Six people, including four children, killed in a suburban home. In the capital today, hundreds gathered to pay their respects at a public funeral. 
J.P. Tasker was there. Hi, Papi. Just wanted to say that you are amazing dad. And not only a dad, you are an amazing friend. And an amazing a heartbreaking father. tribute from an 11-year-old girl who just lost her dad. Asheri Amarakun's father, Gamini, was one of the six victims of the recent Ottawa mass killing. And just look over us and take care of us. And we're sorry that we weren't there when you needed it. And I hope you have a good time wherever you are. That senseless burst of violence on March 6 has shaken Barhaven, a sleepy suburban community on the outskirts of the nation's capital. Gamini recently moved here to start a better life for his family. Thanks for being a lovely husband and an amazing father all the time. His wife back in Sri Lanka, Dishani, was grief-stricken as she joined today's funeral online, singing a short tune for her late husband. I'm sorry for not being able to stay beside you in this time that you need me the most. Darshakani de Lankuna i Nunukayukani and her four children, Anuka, Ashwini, Ranaya, and two month old Kelly, were also killed on that fateful night. Deep breath in, release the breath, and relax. Buddhist monks consoled the 300 mourners who packed into a conference center for the ceremony. May all living beings be free from suffering. May all living beings be free from pain and grief. May all living beings be free from miseries. The only survivor, Danushka Rikrama Singha, was injured in the deadly knife attack that claimed his wife and children. But he was well enough to attend today's send-off, his hands wrapped in bandages. A GoFundMe campaign has raised over $200,000 to help him rebuild after losing nearly all of his loved ones. Coming here today and I'm standing right in front of the the hearses here and it made it very, very real. It's so sad. The close-knit Sri Lankan community in Ottawa has been traumatized by these murders, says Bagia Jawira. She didn't know the family personally, but their deaths have hit close to home. And the sight of six hearses lined up outside, a chilling reminder of what's been lost. I can't believe something like this can ever happen to anyone, especially to four kids. And like a whole family ripped apart, another family ripped apart. Their father was taken away from them. Can't imagine. The alleged suspect, 19-year-old Fabrio de Zoiza, is behind bars and he's facing six first-degree murder charges. Police have been tight-lipped and a motive is unknown to the public. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is reaffirming his vow to launch a ground operation in Rafah. More than a million Palestinians are sheltering in the southern Gaza city, many living in tents. Netanyahu says Rafah is also the last stronghold of the militant group Hamas. If we stop the war now before achieving its goals, it would mean Israel would lose, he says, and we cannot allow this. Netanyahu says civilians in Rafah would be allowed to leave. Meanwhile, Israel's bombardment of Gaza continues. Rescuers comb through the rubble of a house destroyed by an airstrike. The Hamas-run health ministry says more than 90 people were killed over the weekend. Israel is sending a delegation to new ceasefire talks in Doha, but there is little sign of an agreement anytime soon. A temporary ceasefire would allow for more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza, Food, medicine and other much-needed supplies have only slowly trickled in since the start of the war. About 80 kilometres away in the occupied West Bank, workers with the Palestinian Red Crescent are trying their best to help the people of Gaza, but they face significant hurdles. CBC's senior international correspondent Margaret Evans has that story for us tonight. An emergency call centre at the Palestine Red Crescent Society in Ramallah, set up with the help of Canadian money a decade ago and mainly serving the occupied West Bank. Since October 7th, it's been receiving a lot more calls from Gaza. The teams there struggling to operate under an Israeli military campaign that has claimed more than 30,000 lives. 
I don't think about the future, says Nihal Kordi, a nurse who works at the call center. I think only that I want this war to finish because the pain is so hard. Dispatcher Rana Faka believes Israel targets Red Crescent workers in Gaza. We lost 14 of our staff while they were working providing humanitarian care, she says. 13 workers have also apparently been detained for questioning. Details of the agency's movements are normally communicated to the Israeli military through international partners. Last month, the Red Crescent suspended missions in Gaza for 48 hours as a protest, saying they couldn't guarantee safety for staff or patients. In January, two of their medics were dispatched to rescue a lone child surrounded by dead relatives after their car was apparently hit by Israeli fire as they fled Gaza City. <laughs> Faka is one of three dispatchers who spoke with six-year-old Hind Rajab for three hours as she and they waited for Israeli confirmation of a secure route for an ambulance. The Red Crescent released parts of the recorded call, the fear in Hin's voice clear and the pain in Faka's, as she tells the little girl she will stay on the phone until help reaches her. <laughs> it's getting dark, says Hin. <laughs> it's almost night. I'm scared. Please come and get me. <laughs> Darling, says Faka, I swear if I could, I would come and get you. The call center eventually lost contact with Hind and the medics who went to find her, the burnt-out remains of their ambulance and the bodies of Hind and her family found several days later. I felt like I had lost a daughter, says Faka. In response to a query from CBC News about the targeting allegations, the Israel Defense Forces responded that Hamas regularly hides behind medical facilities. It also said detained individuals are released if found not to be involved in what they called terrorist activities. There are conflicting reports about whether Israeli tanks were operating in the area when Hind was in contact with the Red Crescent. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Ramallah. The situation on the ground in Haiti continues to spiral out of control as criminal gangs and national security forces fight in the country's capital city, Port-au-Prince. Amid the escalating violence, the U.S. has announced a plan to help its stranded citizens get out. But as Philip Lee Shannock reports, there isn't a similar plan for Canadians. <laughs> With reports that armed gangs looted a UNICEF aid container in Pota Plants and that the Guatemalan Honorary Consul Office had been ransacked, the U.S. State Department has announced a plan to airlift citizens from Haiti. A charter flight will take off from Cap Haitien International Airport, but only for people with valid U.S. passports. Andy Fowler, an American pastor in Haiti, doing prison rehabilitation work, doubts that many will opt to make the five or six hour drive to the airport 200 kilometers north of the capital. For most of the people in the middle of the violence going on in Port-au-Prince, Cap Haitian is not even accessible to them. They can't reach it there. So it actually doesn't help a lot of the people affected by this gang violence that is currently going on. He says most of the capital and all the roads north of it are controlled by armed gangs. Global Affairs Canada says there are about 3,000 Canadians registered in Haiti, but there are no evacuation flights planned for now. Gilles Rivald is a former Canadian ambassador to Haiti. He says the logistics of getting people out are difficult. It's not just a question of putting a plane on the tarmac and say, by the way, all Canadian citizens get on board. You have to filter to make sure that all the citizens that are getting on board are Canadian citizens. Global Affairs Canada says it's evacuated its non-essential embassy staff to the Dominican Republic, which shares the island of Hispaniola with the Republic of Haiti. Laval says that would be the logical escape route for Canadians. If we decide to evacuate some people, there is maybe a possibility if the situation becomes very, very, very serious, uh, you can always use a helicopter from the Dominican Republic. Last week, Prime Minister Ariel Henry agreed to resign, but that has done little to stop the violence. 
and Lavalde is hopeful that order can be restored once a transitional government is created. But with gangs in control of the capital, aid blocked, and the plan for political stability stalled, humanitarian groups say four million people are in immediate need of aid, and more than one million people are on the brink of famine. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead, Narendra Modi seems poised to win a third term as India's Prime Minister in the upcoming election. That's worrying Indian Muslims who are speaking out against Modi's Hindu-first policies, which they say leads to anger and violence against them. That's coming up on Your World Tonight. Southern Iceland is under a state of emergency after another volcanic eruption. A warning siren sends tourists rushing out of a geothermal pool at the Blue Lagoon Resort south of the capital Reykjavik. The eruption happened last night, spewing smoke and bright orange lava into the air. It's the fourth eruption since December and the most powerful one yet. The lava flow has now slowed. Special barriers set up around the nearby village of Grindavik have helped divert lava toward the sea. Donald Trump's re-election campaign is navigating controversy caused by comments he made this weekend. In a wide-ranging speech, the former U.S. president made a slew of charged statements against immigration, the economy, and the future of American democracy. Katie Simpson reports from Washington. China now is building a couple of massive plants. In the heart of the Rust Belt, Donald Trump drew cheers at his outdoor rally when he promised to create more American auto jobs. As he vaguely outlined his plan to make domestic vehicles more appealing to buy, he casually and unexpectedly delivered a stark warning. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole... That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. While Trump's campaign insists he was speaking about the auto sector and the U.S. economy, his critics, including former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, have seized on these comments. What does that mean? He's going to exact a bloodbath? There's something wrong here. Joe Biden's re-election campaign team accused Trump of doubling down on political violence, also denouncing his plans to free those charged or convicted of crimes related to the January 6th attack. On Saturday, Trump called Capitol Hill rioters hostages and patriots, paying tribute to them by playing a video of a January 6th jailhouse choir singing the national anthem. Please rise for the horribly and unfairly treated January 6th hostages. This kind of praise drew criticism even from within his own Republican Party deeply disappointing Trump's former vice president, Mike Pence. Well, I think it's very unfortunate at a time that there are American hostages being held in Gaza that uh, the president or any other leaders would refer to people that are moving through our, our uh, justice system uh, as hostages. And uh, it's just... It's just unacceptable. Trump's team is standing by his January 6th statements, as well as his repeated use of dehumanizing language about migrants. If you call them people, I don't know if you call them people. This kind of rhetoric is a continuing theme throughout his entire political career. The public is about to get a better sense of how all of this is actually resonating with voters. Wednesday is the deadline for presidential campaigns to file paperwork with federal authorities, showing just how much money candidates have been able to raise in donations. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Workers at an Airbus plant in Montreal have approved a strike mandate. It comes after 99% of union members voted to reject a contract offer from the company. Salary increases, bonuses and job security are among the main issues. About 1,300 people work at the plant, which bills the smallest Airbus commercial jets. Despite the mandate, a strike has not yet been called. The two sides are expected to continue negotiations on Monday. Well, India is constitutionally a secular country. But for the past decade, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his party, the BJP, have pushed a Hindu-first agenda. And attacks on non-Hindus have increased, especially against Muslims. The western state of Maharashtra is emerging as a tinderbox for sectarian violence, with more than 100 incidents last year. And with an election set to begin in a month, it's expected to get worse. Our South Asia correspondent Salima Shivji tells us more. 
The streets of Pusesawali village deep in India's western Maharashtra state seem calm, but that belies simmering communal tension. Outside the local mosque stands a police officer, here around the clock. Months after an angry Hindu mob tore through the town chanting anti-Muslim slogans. They burst into the mosque during evening prayers, brandishing metal rods, witnesses say, killing one man, 31-year-old Nurul Hassan Shikalgar, and shattering his young bride's life. Uh, it's my engagement photos. Yeah. Both childish nature. Nurul was always laughing, joking, Aisha Shikalgar says. His loss is a wound that won't heal. It's getting worse with time, not better, she says. The pain even more acute because she was six months pregnant when her husband was killed. With a baby, he'll never know. The scar is not only emotional in the small town, says this local man, pointing to a mass of mangled and burned scooters near the mosque, a constant reminder of the damage the mob's fury wrought. Shakira Bhagwan keeps reliving it. The rioters were throwing stones, so we locked ourselves inside our shop, she says, and they kept screaming horrible anti-Muslim slurs at us. It's not an isolated incident. In an India where rallies promoting Hindutva, the idea of Hindu supremacy over other religions are multiplying. Events where inflammatory hate speech pushing violence is front and center, like this one in a town called Jalna. If we sit at home and do nothing, your sisters will be converted and marry jihadis, this far-right leader warns a crowd. She's referencing what some call love jihad, a conspiracy theory used to whip up communal divisions that accuses Muslim men of wooing Hindu girls to convert them. It comes up at rally after rally, like this one in another Maharashtra town, where an elected politician tells a large crowd if you find any love jihadis or cow killers, they should be killed. At yet another rally in Mumbai, a legislator floats the idea of impunity for anyone committing a crime against Muslims. The government is with you, the MLA says. Do what you need to do for the Hindu religion. All of those rallies took place in Maharashtra, a state that activists warn is becoming India's new communal tinderbox. Huge wave of anti-Muslim hate speech. For Rakib Hamid Naik, who meticulously tracks hate speech in India from a safe distance in the U.S., it's a worrying trend. There were 668 hate speech events throughout 2023, and 75% of those events took place in states ruled by the BJP. The Bharatiya Janata Party, in power nationally, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who's seeking a third term this June. Naik says that means his research group, India Hate Lab, will be busier than usual. We expect a steep rise in hate speech events. But for some observers, it's not just the spike in rallies that's a problem. It's that hate has seeped into popular culture. Hindutva pop with anti-Muslim lyrics is getting millions of views. We are Hindus and India is ours, this singer croons. Catchy beats with a dangerous message, says Kunal Purohit a journalist who wrote a book delving into the world of Hindutva pop stars. The Hindu right wing has realized that hate doesn't have to be a boring political speech. Hate can be entertaining. Hate can be an everyday affair. Making it more insidious, he says, and harder to monitor. But for Aisha, it doesn't matter what sparked the hate that changed her life forever. There's a divide between Hindus and Muslims here now, she says. I feel it everywhere, and it can't ever be repaired. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Satara District, Maharashtra. You are listening to Your World Tonight from CBC News. I'm Stephanie Skanderis. You can hear Your World Tonight and other CBC radio programs wherever you are on your favorite podcast app. Berlin is known for its vibrant, diverse arts and cultural scene, from film festivals to art galleries and the city's famed nightclubs. The German capital attracts artists from around the world, and that scene is supported by billions of euros in funding from various levels of the German government. But now it's being threatened by the fallout over the war in Gaza. Rebecca Collard explains why from Berlin. It was a big night at the Berlin Alley International Film Festival, but it was met with big protests. Activists dropped mock evacuation notices on a courtyard filled with attendees. 
some below began chanting with the activists. Germany is a key political and military supporter of Israel, but demonstrations like this one are also protesting the dozens of closures, cancellations and funding cuts of artists and organizations accused of anti-Semitism here. Artists and activists accused Germany of using accusations of anti-Semitism to censor voices that criticize Israel or disagree with the German government's position on the war in Gaza. In November, Oyun, a cultural space in Berlin's Neukölln district held an event tagged as a moment of mourning and hope for Israelis and Palestinians. The city of Berlin was supporting Oyun with space and funding, some of the around 1 billion euros the city spends on culture every year. Luna Sub, Oyun's co-founder, says the city warned them not to hold the event. Two days later, the senator announced in, in like a public hearing um, that they will review our funding. And two weeks later, they announced that the funding will be cut. Berlin's cultural senator said the city was responsible to fight anti-Semitism in all its forms. But the event Oyun hosted was organized by Jewish Voice for Peace, a Jewish organization that has clashed before with the German government over Israel policy. If this won't stop now, then I feel there's no turning back. And that will have an incredibly painful impact on Germany's arts and culture. Oyun is challenging the decision in the courts, but that could take months or even longer. Meanwhile, they have held fundraisers and started a GoFundMe campaign to cover legal fees, stay open, and keep their staff. In an abandoned school in Berlin, artists and activists are carving out a new space. 20-somethings, many of them wearing Palestinian kofias, sip beer and talk politics as they wait for a drag show to start. The location of the event wasn't posted online, only provided by direct message to trusted invitees. So basically the concept behind Thoda was to provide artists who have had their gigs cancelled or who are choosing to strike with paid gigs and in an environment they want to play in. Zena is one of the organizers. She doesn't want to give her last name, fearing repercussions. On top of the dozens of artists, authors and intellectuals that have faced cancellations, there have been DJs, performers and musicians. Zena says the last few months have shown the danger of having culture so reliant on government funding. When the state controls your income, when they control your funding, when they also control what you say and what you do and the kind of work that you put out. After thousands of cultural workers signed a petition, Berlin scrapped a plan to require all recipients of funding to sign on to a definition of anti-Semitism that includes criticism of Israel. And increasingly, Berlin is losing its reputation as the home of a diverse arts and culture scene and freedom of expression. Rebecca Collard for CBC News, Berlin. I would only be in you. It's the Dolly Parton classic that a lot of people don't know is a Dolly Parton classic. I Will Always Love You was released 50 years ago this month in 1974. Parton penned it the year before. On the same day, she wrote another of her biggest hits, Jolene. I Will Always Love You is about Parton's musical breakup with Porter Wagoner. It almost had a life with Elvis Presley, but his notorious manager, Colonel Tom Parker, demanded half the songwriting rights, and Parton said no. Nearly two decades later, the song would become larger than life. And I will always love you. Whitney Houston's version is the only version for a lot of people. Parton herself said she was overwhelmed hearing it, saying she took it and made it so much more than what it would ever have been. But there's still no denying the simpler charm of the original. On Instagram, Dolly Parton marked the anniversary with a montage of her singing I Will Always Love You through the years and said it will always hold a special place in her heart. And as you reflect on the original, you might want to do the same for the other Dolly classic we mentioned. Jolene, 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 please don't take him just because you 
because Jolene could soon be in for a superstar revamp. There's a rumor going around that Beyonce has covered it for her new country album, which is coming out at the end of the month. A prospect Dolly Parton herself says she's very excited about. Here's some more of the original Jolene on Your World Tonight. I'm Stephanie Skanderis. Thank you for being with us. Good night. He talks about two in his sleep And there's nothing I can do to keep from crying When he calls your name, Jolene